We're going to do a little video on the steps and guitar setup and then someone requested this video and you know I'm having to film here by myself so what you get to see is my hands and the guitar and a few things like that. But let's see what we can do with this. The well, first thing we're going to do is look at uh, a couple of the tools that I use. I'm going to have four main tools and the first thing I use dial calipers. Uh, this is probably one of my most used tools right here. And then you'll see these things in action. Remember, this is just a pair of dial, dial calipers. Um, I'm going to use a capo, especially if you're having to work by yourself on some things. And then nut files. If you have to make adjustments on the nut, there's just no substitute for a good set of nut files. You don't have to have one for every string. Um, you could get by with three of them pretty easy. You could use a 13. And you could use that for a couple of slots and then a 24 or 26, 28 even, and then 46, something like that. And what you do and you have to make a wider slot is you roll the file. So you go like this and you roll it around like that and you can make the slot a little bit wider. Now, of course, I, I do this all the time, so I have, you know, a full set of six. But you, as an amateur, you, you can get by with three pretty easy and you can do quite a few things with that. Okay, so here's a guitar. This is a Stratocaster. This is a um, an American um, vintage. And first thing you do, well, the first thing I look at on a guitar when it comes in, regardless of whether it's an acoustic or an electric, I'm using an electric here simply because it was convenient and has an adjustable truss rod, you know. But the principle is exactly the same for electric, acoustic, mandolin, upright bass, banjo, everything. Start here unless you have a valid reason. I'm going to tell you the reason why I do everything, so follow along on that. Okay. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the relief on the guitar. And this is where your capo comes in handy. You can clamp it up here around the first fret, on the first fret. And what we're trying to do, you can use your finger for this too, but this makes it easier for me to have two hands. So I've got a capo up here on the first fret. And then I'm going to go down here to the body. The neck, uh, you know, the truss rod only works on a certain part of the neck. On electric, they've got a long neck and the heel comes down into here. On an upright, I mean, I'm sorry, on an acoustic guitar, you're not going to get much past the 12th fret. So on an acoustic guitar, you're going to be looking at the 12th fret to the 1st fret. But on an electric, you can come on down here to about the 15th fret or so. It doesn't really matter. What we're going to see is this. You're going to hold the string down here. This makes the string into a straight edge. Now, what I want is to press about halfway in between here, right in here, and I want the tiniest, tiniest amount of relief that I can get away with here. And this is probably about two thousandths of an inch right here. It is barely any relief at all. Um, normally I would have this backlit to where I can see it and I could actually measure it and see, but what I'm doing here is the second technique of tapping it. I'm tapping it right there. You can hear it, you can feel it, you can see. You can check the other strings if you want, and you'll find that the relief varies a little bit across the neck. That's not a big deal. I want that neck almost flat, and there's a couple of good reasons for that, which um, I'm not sure much in detail I want to go on this, but basically, if your neck has a dip in it like this, it has relief, it's going to buzz up in here if your action gets low. That's because the neck is on it, on the body at an angle, and your string Contrary to what you may have heard, that's a little bit of misinformation going around. Your string does not vibrate in an arc like this. The string vibrates in a wave. It's got three or four parts on it, depending on, on where you pluck the string. So if you pluck a string down here, like most people do, you set up a wave that goes from here, and here, and here, and here, a four-part wave. The middle of the neck is not going to be the point of maximum amplitude. The point of maximum amplitude is going to be more right around in here when you hit an open string. The instant you fret a note right here, you you just shorten the scale, you see, and now the point of maximum amplitude is about right over here. Well, obviously then the relief isn't going to help you there. So, also, on a guitar like an electric guitar, let's say you come up here to the 12th fret, there's no relief up here. The truss rod is not having any effect up here. You have a flat neck from the 12th fret on up into here. So you can set the rest of the neck to be flat so that you have a 
I'm going to say perfectly flat, not quite perfectly flat in there. The only reason that you really want any relief whatsoever in the neck is just to make sure that it's not back bowed. So that is a back bow would be when the middle of the neck is the highest point on the neck. If you have that situation, then when you fret right here, you're going to get a buzz up in here. So the only real reason for having any kind of relief at all is to give the guitar a little bit of room to move. Now, especially on an electric guitar, well, even on the acoustics, any guitar that I'm, any instrument that I'm going to play in the mid-range of the neck right here, so a mandolin, you know, playing the long A chord, I want that neck to be pretty flat. So I'm going to check the relief. That's the first thing I'm going to check. And to adjust the relief, you turn the truss rod. To reduce the relief, you tighten the truss rod. That makes the neck bow backwards. And to reduce the relief, you loosen the truss rod and you let the strings pull it forward. You need to know what kind of truss rod you have. Um, the fender's going to have a one-way rod, but some guitars have a two-way rod. And that means you can actually physically adjust the neck. So in other words, on this one-way rod, the strings pull the neck up, the rod counteracts it. But on a two-way rod, the rod will control it both ways. You need to know that because there's going to be a dead spot in, the, in, in that two-way rod. There'll be a slack spot right there. And people think, oh, the nut's loose or something. Well, no, it's not. You've got to get past that and make it pull the other direction. So you need to know which way. If you need to adjust the truss rod, uh, now the, the nut's up on the on the heel in this vintage type Stratocaster, but if it was up here, or if it was accessible through the sound hole, like most guitars are, then what I do is put a padded bag under the neck, and then I hold the guitar down over here, take my wrench in this hand, or in this hand, which the case might be, put some pressure on the neck, go ahead and push down on the nut, and pre-stress that neck. And if you, I don't know if you can see it on the video, but you can see the strings move. And if you play, you know, if you've ever played with a guitar like that, you know, you can bend the neck back and forth and change the pitch. And it's kind of a fun little wah-wah or a uh, tremolo effect if you don't have one. But you, all you're doing is pre-stressing that neck so that the truss rod doesn't have to take all the tension on it. So put a little bit of tension on that neck, turn the truss rod, and then check it again. You don't have to let the guitar sit for three or four days or a week or anything to see what effect it has. You can see the effect right away. Okay? So stage two. After I've got the neck relief where I want it, which is pretty flat, then I'm going to come up here and look at the nut. On the nut, I'm going to hold the string right here between the first, I'm sorry, yeah, but right here between the second and third frets, right here. And I'm going to look at the clearance right here over the first fret. And I want the absolute minimum clearance that I can get. So in other words, if there is a sliver of light, and I mean a sliver of light, between the first fret and the string, that's where I want it. I don't want it any higher. So in other words, let's do this. This would be bad. I'm going to get a little chew of that here. And I'm going to crank this up so that I'm going to have, a, I'm going to simulate a high nut slot here. Now when I push down over here, see there's a gap in here. And I can push it down, I can feel it. This nut slot would be too high if it was like that. In other words, let's do it like this. Okay, let's just take this nut, take this string out, set it up on top of the snut for a minute. Okay, really super high nut slot, right? Hold the string down here, you got a big gap right here. Too high. Now I'm going to slide it back down into the groove there. Do it again. The reason that I want it there is to get a consistent feel. There's no reason for it to be any higher unless you play slide guitar. And if you play slide guitar, then you're going to have a whole different setup anyways. If you need to play slide guitar once in a while on one of these guitars, you know, you can stick a piece of rubber or a pencil or whatever, like um, the guy with Leonard Skinner used to do. You know, you slide it up into here, you raise the nut up, and you have an instant slide guitar. But if you're playing with your fingers, there's really no reason to have a high nut. In fact, it'll cause these strings to go out of tune. So the reason that I want it, the nut slots to be fret height is for this reason. Okay? Here's the logic of why this, why this should be this way. Let's suppose you fret this note here. 
how high is the string right here? What determines the height? So in other words, I'm fretting it right here. The string is fretted on the third fret. What determines the height of that string on the fourth fret? It's the height of this fret. It's the height of the third fret. Okay, so let's back up here. I'm going to fret at the second fret. What determines the string's height over the third fret? The height of the second fret does. I'm going to slide back one more. This height right here is determined by the height of this fret. Therefore, when you get to the nut, it should be exactly as if there was a zero fret under here. So if you had another fret right under that nut that's the same height as this, then you would have a good nut slot height. So the nut basically is a zero fret. The nut is a, I like to think of it, when I finally got this concept and I resisted it for a long time, but when I finally got it, it was like the nut is a parking garage for an invisible fret under here. Okay? So if you need to adjust it, you get your fret files here, you pull the string out, and you move it like this. And you want to hold your file so that it kind of almost bisects the angle between the string. You can see the string running over here and then dives. And you want to bisect that angle more or less. It's not a bad idea to get the final little edge a little bit more wall so that it gives the string a little bit of a curved surface. Um, and that keeps the nut from chipping at the back. On the nut itself, I am personally fairly picky about the spacing of the strings right here. Um, fenders in particular will use spacing where every string has an equal center. And I don't like that because to me these strings feel cramped. The bigger strings feel cramped because they're a bigger diameter and they're at the same center. So there's not much room in between the strings and they just they feel really cramped to me. And if you look on this guitar here you can see where I filled in the nut slots and I used um, pieces of bone and filled them in. I didn't want to make a new nut on this guitar. I just wanted to do this quick and dirty method on any, um, like a Martin or anything good like that. I'm probably going to make a new nut. But on the Fender, I didn't want to chip the nut out and I didn't want to reshape it and all that. It's my guitar, so I'm not worried about the way it looks much. So I filled in the nut slots and then I recut them. And this is where I use the calipers and I want the same distance in between the strings and to me that feels so much roomier um, because my finger comes down here and there's the same distance to the next string it feels roomier, chords are easier, it just falls into place for me and I'm fairly particular about the nut slots like that so if the nut slots aren't right on a guitar um, that's one thing I'm going to fix okay so the order that I've done here is I've done the wreck relief and then I've done the nut slots. The nut slots will affect the action, which is the height of the string off of the fingerboard. And we can refer to the action anywhere. We can refer to a first fret action or a second fret action or a twelfth fret action. It doesn't make any difference. The action is simply the height of the strings off of the fingerboard. And obviously the nut slots affect that because again, if I come over here and pull this up out of here, and set it up here, all of a sudden, see that's way high up here. So, the nut slots affect the action. That's why I do the relief first and then the nut slot. You can do the nut slots first and then do the relief, but it will have a, a minor effect. So I just do the relief first and then I do the nut slots. Once I've got that done, then I come over here and I set the 12th fret action. Now in electric guitars it's common to refer to like a 15th fret action or whatever fret but I use 12th fret to keep it consistent because on an acoustic guitar the, well on every guitar the 12th fret is midway between the nut and the saddle and so if you need to change the action here by let's say 10 thousandths of an inch then it's going to take a 20 thousandths of an inch adjustment at the saddle so 10 thousandths here equals 20 thousandths at the saddle on an acoustic guitar, I'm going to measure the saddle. I'm going to write that number down, and I'm going to adjust my new saddle depending on which way I want to go. I've got a video on this one too. So, I'm going to take and I'm going to check my action here. I get my feel gauges, and you know, you got to go by well. You, you, the action is not set according to a number, but once you get an action that you like, 
then measure it. And you can duplicate that action again. What if I took this guitar apart, you know? Or what if the neck was thicker on this guitar than another guitar? It's going to change the way the guitar feels. And a lot of times, that's what a setup is a lot of times. People say, oh, this guitar feels funny. Well, that's just because they haven't measured the action. And they're, what they're feeling is the feel of the neck. So it's, it's just good to know what your number is. I like to know the numbers, okay? So based on previous experience, I like my electric guitars to be about 84 thousandths of an inch here. And then I drop anywhere from two to four thousandths of an inch, depending on you know what I want this to be. So let's say 84, and then I'm gonna drop to just a little bit above 80. I'm gonna come over here, and I'm gonna drop to a little bit above 76. I like my D and G to be the same. So I'm gonna put these two about the same and then I'm gonna drop another two, three, four thousandths of an inch on down to here. And so I usually keep my electric pretty flat, fairly flat. All right, the way to do this, everything's set. You know, you got the nut set. That's why people say, oh, you need to put a capo at the first fret to take the nut out of the equation. Well, set the nut correctly so that the slots are nut height and you won't have that problem anymore. Now the nut is set correctly. So once you've got that done, then come up here. And all you do, you get your feeder gauge, set it for what stack you want, and you come in between here and you push down on that. Okay? This one seems to be a little bit low. It's probably the humidity's come up on it or whatever. But anyway, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, here it is. Come on the wrong fret. You come up here and you measure it and you should feel a clicking noise. Try to have the strat a little bit slower than that. It comes in here. And it'll move, and you can keep going across it. And this is not the way I do it. You know, right now I'm doing this so the camera can, can what I really do is I put it up on my shoulder like this. Let's get the camera up here. I put it up on my shoulder, and this way I can look at the feeler gauge, and yeah, and I can see the gap. And I can see a shadow of the string on the feeler gauge. I like to have a backlight over here. I like to have a light right here, my shop light so that I can see down here and I will see the shadow of the string on the feeler gauge. Plus I can touch it. Same technique I used up there. I can feel that. So there's my little gap right there. And this happens to be 76, no, no. yeah. 76 thousandths of an inch. So the strat's a little bit low right now. Humidity changes. I work my way across, check all the actions. And then on the Strat or any electric guitar, it's real easy. You just get a wrench and you turn it and then adjust it the way you want it to do. And you can even do this if you're, if you're agile enough. You can hold the feeler gauge up here. And then you can come over here and you can turn the wrench and boop, drop that string right down onto the feeler gauge. On an acoustic guitar, what you're going to do is measure it, write down the measurements, and then you're going to adjust the saddle. So you can take the saddle out or leave it in or whatever, and I'm going to caliper it and I'm gonna see what kind of action I have. So I will go like this. And see, I could even do it on this too. I could come in here and I could measure that height if I wanted to. I wouldn't do this on electric. And I could say, oh, 390, 392. I need to go down 10 thousandths of an inch. So I'm gonna go down to 380 and just down there and check it again. That's what I would do on an acoustic. On an electric, like I said, you've got these convenient little nuts and bolts here, and you just turn them and measure it. So these are easy to do. Okay? So that's the basics on the setup there. Now, on electric, you've got the pickups too. And, you know, you can you'll adjust the pickup height. Let's go down a little bit again. You'll adjust the pickup height to the string to get the kind of sounds you want. If the pickup is lower, um, closer down to the pick guard, You'll have a warmer, mellower, more sustained. It won't be as hot. Um, that's okay. Every pickup set's going to be different, or every brand and all that kind of thing, you know. And you might want to make some minor adjustments. There's no problem with that. But the basic technique that I use on an electric is I hold it down at the last fret and I measure the distance here. You can't do it with this. You got to get something that's not magnetic because that wants to go in there and clip. But you measure this distance right here. You could use a caliper, so I use a little ruler. And I set them to be about um, four millimeters from the top of the pole to the bottom of the string. And I set them all the same at first. Then I go over to the treble string and I do the same thing. I don't like a real shrill tone myself. And I'll set those to be about three millimeters. 
A lot of guys set them at two millimeters, which is fine. That all depends on your ears, your playing style, your amp, whatever. But again, I have a consistent starting point. And then from there, then I'll plug in and I'll play the guitar a little bit and I'll listen to the notes and I'll move the pickups up and down a little bit and get it where I want it. If you get the pickups too close to the strings, then the magnets are going to pull that string down. If you ever loosen your strings up, you'll see, whomp, you'll see the magnet pull the string. So if you get the strings, the magnets too close to the string, it's going to stop it from vibrating. And you get a much punchier sound, you can get wolf tones, you can get overtones, you can get undesirable kind of sounds. So me personally, uh, I like my pickups to be a little farther away from the strings. This particular set is a, is a kind of a vintage sounding set and, and they sound a little bit weaker than I'm used to so I did adjust them back up closer to the string. Some of the hotter pickups, the Texas Specials or any hot round pickup, um, I generally pull them farther away from the string. And I even have the middle pickup sitting flush on the pick guard many times on a strap because I like to have my, you know, I'm a Telecaster guy really. And I like to have that extra space in there for finger picking and whatnot. Plus, when you put the middle pickup down, it tends to give the strap, uh, it accentuates that little quackiness that you can get from the middle position. That's a personal preference again, okay? But there's your pickup deal. So I think we've covered everything. The first step again for me, neck relief. Second step, Here's the guitar. First step, neck relief. Second step is going to be the nut height, like this, right here. <laughs> right up between the, the second and the third, and it should just barely clear. Yeah, it's doing it. I mean, right there, it's just absolutely barely clearing. In fact, if I look at it, yeah, it's clearing. It almost looks like the windings are just touching, but and I'm going to set every single one of them the same. My personal preference on the nuts is to have equal distance between the strings. And then I've got the relief, I've got the nut, and then I come down here and set the 12th fret action. Yeah, I use a set of feeler gauges to get my starting point. I rarely tweak after that. I mean, I know what I want in a guitar, and I know what I want in an electric guitar, and acoustic guitar. I set the action to that. And I don't really deviate much from that unless I have a specific purpose or reason for it. So if I have like a, a guitar that I'm going to play more swing and jazz on, then I will set the action a little bit lower, and I'm not going to I'm not going to thrash on it or anything. If I've got a guitar that I'm going to use for straight bluegrass, and I'm going to be capoing a lot on it, um, that changes the the strings a little bit. You know that changes the amount of flex the strings have in it. I might set that guitar a little bit higher. I'm going to play rhythm on it a lot. I might want to play that one just a little bit harder. So I might set that one up just a little higher. And again, I know the numbers on this. I'm going to want 93 thousandths of an inch, 96 thousandths of an inch at the most. Um, I don't like to fight the guitar too much. On the electrics, I like to have about 80 to 85 thousandths of an inch on the low E. And again, I step down from there. On mandolins, I want the the G to be 50 thousandths of an inch, and I'm going to step down to about 45 thousandths of an inch. Um, pretty even, pretty even action on mandolins. On a mandolin, especially, I've got a mandolin on the wall. That's why I'm pointing. On a mandolin or any short scale instrument, the nut height is critical. If you don't have that nut exactly right, it will pull it out of tune, and it'll feel really hard to play. So. The nut height and the relief are really, really, really critical on a, on a short scale thing like a mandolin. Okay, so that's the quick and dirty of guitar setup. Hope that helps.